so our uh, topic for today is this uh, very interesting topic of hemophagocytic histo histolymphocytosis. Okay, so um, let me just see whether I can hide this. Um, oh, there we are. Oh, sorry. Can you still can you still see my slides? Yes, yeah, yeah? I can still okay. see them. Good, 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 good. Okay. All right. So I'll just start with a case history then. So uh, we have a 16-year-old uh, girl who had actually a very interesting neurosurgical history. So she was initially uh, one of our neurosurgical patients. So what happened to her was she uh, presented to Adam Brooks Hospital, where she was at the time in December 2020, with a left-sided inch, well, with, um, with essentially confusion, ataxia, incessant vomiting, um, uh, uh, basically all the neurological signs uh, suggesting of raised intracranial pressure. And he, and sorry, and she later was found to have uh, a left intraparenchymal intraventricular hemorrhage. So she had a left craniotomy and clot evaluation, uh, evacuation at Adam Brooks. Uh, and, and, and an EVD was later inserted because she also has some concerns postoperatively uh, uh, with a raised intracranial pressure. She was very, very unwell. She was treated with methylpred, uh, uh, and she was also given two doses of IVIG, uh, and uh, she was diagnosed um, of ITP, um, and she was started on uh, tran tranexamic acid and later l which uh, is quite, which is a new, quite a new treatment for ITP. So her clinical course following the operation was that she started having fluctuating temperatures since the beginning of February. Um, at first, uh, we thought, well, uh, she had these signs with increased swelling and fluid over her left craniotomy side. So of course, this is gonna be a, 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 a operation site infection. So she was admitted uh, and in fact, there were frank pus oozing from the wound. Um, so she was taken to theater for left craniotomy, wound washout. So during the um, uh, wound washout on the 20th of February, the surgeons actually inspected the, 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 the wound, the bone flap, um, and um, they resected all the necrotic ulcerated tissue around um, uh, around the uh, around the surgical site, um, they debrided all the all, all, all the uh, unsurvivable tissue, and the tissue was also found to be foul smelling, uh, according to the operative notes. Um, however, they they inspected the bone flap itself, and they didn't think that it, it appeared overtly infected, so they washed it with. Uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide and saline solution, soaked in betadine, and and then replaced it. Um, at this point, she was a, she was admitted to PICU again, and then she was stepped down to the ward. She was commenced on keftriaxone and vancomycin and metronidazole, and the, the original plan was to complete two weeks. However, uh, a few days after the temperatures, um, sorry, a few days after the operation, she started spiking temperatures again, um, and uh, this time to 39.40. So at this point, uh, her keftriaxone was changed to meropenem. This didn't really help with anything. She still kept on having ongoing temperature spikes, and she deteriorated with tachycardia and hypertension on the uh, on the first of March. The, she was taken for a CT head at that point, uh, but the CT head was actually quite okay, apart from a little bit of soft tissue swelling, query, uh, a, a, soft, uh, a, a small soft tissue collection. There were no other uh, intracranial uh, collection off note. She was also started on Amy Kaysen, uh, so, and so she's now on four antibiotics, and she was taken to theater again. And this time, and this time, the um, uh, the bone flap was removed, and they replaced it with a titanium mesh. 
uh, on top of the on on top of on top of the, essentially the the brain tissue. Um, the tissue microbiology result also came back and it showed that it grew Cutobacterium anus. And according to the microbiologist, this could represent a chronic indolent infection over the last two months since the initial presentation, but rather than something that is, uh, uh, is, is causing her acute deterioration. And she was given another IVIG uh, uh, on, the, on the 3rd of March. So at this point, <clears throat> we're a little bit stuck. Um, because she's still highly febrile, she is on four antibiotics already. The neurosurgeons have taken, taken, uh, uh, taken her to theater twice now, and they're fairly confident that uh, they've not really left, they've not left any septic material behind. We also look for alternative sources of infection. We did an echo for infective endocarditis, which was normal. And her blood cultures have all have, have been have been all negative. And actually her inflammatory markers were always in the low side. So it was always sort of in the 20 odds. So it's just not very um, commiserate with, with, with what you're seeing, still highly febrile um, and still very systemically unwell. So we started um, investigating for, for other conditions. So we sent some autoimmune um, uh, 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 bloods and it turns out that she was positive for anti-nuclear antibody and she was also positive for anti-raw, anti-la antibodies. So she, 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 she essentially had uh, an un undiagnosed uh, lupus in the background. But then still, we were thinking lupus itself wouldn't really give you such a dramatic picture. And at this point, this is when we talked to the he our hematology colleagues who suggested uh, this could be uh, uh, HLH or his hemophagocytic his histiolymphocytosis or macrophage activation syndrome. Um, is it okay so far? So that's basically the ha case history. So then we took some blood. Um, hematology advised us, well, uh, if HIH is one of our differentials, then one of the things that we should send is a ferritin. And it turns out that her ferritin was sky high. It was 34,000. She also has some other uh, 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 abnormal bloods. So she has got an anemia. She is known to have a thrombo thrombocytopenia, so she's been she's been receiving regular uh, uh, platelet infusions. So actually, on this occasion, the platelets were actually okay. Her neutrophils were also well. Her her, her neutrophils were also on the low side, although um, as you will later see, not low enough to be considered uh, uh, as part of uh, your HLH um, diagnostic criteria. She's also got a fairly high LDH, and she's also got abnormal fasting triglycerides. And like I said, um, the CRP has always been fairly low. We've also sent some other uh, bloods uh, uh, to, to, to look for any alternative sources of, um, of, of fever. Uh, so we sent for quantiferon PB, which was negative, EBV PCR, which was negative, CMV negative, adenovirus negative, COVID negative. Um, and we also sent uh, some bloods for, 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 for fungal infections such as galactomannan and BDG and 18S PCR, which were all negative. So at this point, um, I'm going to bring in um, what we're going to talk about today, uh, which is the, the, the which is HLH. So HLH is a rare, severe systemic inflammatory syndrome. It's got two forms, essentially a primary form, which is associated with an underlying genetic mutation, um, or secondary, which is um, uh, considered to be acquired. So primary is associated with, with all of these uh, uh, gene defects and more. Um, and it's 
It's also known as familial HLH. It normally presents in the first year of life, and it can have a very high mortality rate if it's left untreated and undetected. Whereas secondary HLH has got many triggers, for example, EBV, prolonged, prolonged infection of any sort, malignancy, uh, or autoimmune disorders, uh, or, um, or in fact, chemotherapy. So the pathophysiology of HLH is um, it's essentially an overactive act, it's an overactivation of the histiocytes, which is part of your mononuclear phagocytic system. Um, it consists of macrophages and dendritic cells, and it essentially becomes they essentially become overactive and dysregulated and start attacking your own tissue and cause severe damage, and it causes and, 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 and it can cause quite a great deal of damage to multiple organs. So the signs and symptoms, you have a high and unremitting fever, and in fact, HLH uh, is, is, is an important differential uh, for cases of PUO, pyrexia of unknown origin. Um, it's it's a syndrome that should be kept in mind, especially if you can't find uh, any any obvious source of this in, um, of this fever or an infection. Some patients present uh, some pre some patients present with a rash, uh, hepatitis. They can also be jaundice. A lot of them have organo um, organomegaly. They can show uh, cytopenia. Uh, for example, anemia or thrombocytopenia or neutral, uh, neutropenia. Uh, they can have uh, other sort of slightly non-specific signs such as lymphadenopathy and neurological signs uh, such as confusion, seizures, and coma. So this is the uh, key. This is the cornerstone um, um, uh, uh, article. Um, of essentially how we diagnose, um, how we currently diagnose HLH and how we treat it. So it was first, um, it was first that the protocol, the diagnostic criteria and protocol were first formalized in 19, 1991 by this American society called Histiocyte Society. Um, but uh, it was, it was since revised uh, in, 20, in 2004 in this large study and has now been sort of updated. Uh, if you're interested, you can you can you can you can you can read this article. But essentially, this is the table of your HLH uh, 2004 diagnostic criteria. Don't know whether you can see clearly, but. Um, you either need to have a molecular diagnosis consistent with HLH, so, so one of those um, genetic mut mutations um, uh, like I listed there, or you need to have satisfied five out of the eight criteria below. So let's see in our case what, um, what this girl actually had in terms of meeting with our diagnostic criteria. So she had a she had a high and unremitting fever. There is we were we 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 were querying whether this could be residual infection from the surgical site, but the surgeons were fairly confident that it wasn't, and actually it's not really supported with 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 with, with your with, with your CRP and other things and, and, and your microbiology results. She had splenomegaly and she has cytopenias um, because she was anemic and her platelets were constantly low and in fact she did have fasting triglycerides uh, she, she did have abnormal um, fasting triglycerides I think it was 3.88 so and actually one of the one of the highly sensitive markers for HLH is ferritin so it's, it's said to be 95% sensitive for a diagnosis of HLH. Um, and and um, as we saw in this case, her ferritin was sky high. And that's actually part of the reason why we decided on this uh, particular diagnosis. Okay. 
So like I said, the diagnosis of HLH um, is based on the HLH 2004 criteria, um, and it involves hematological and serological tests. Uh, you saw in the table uh, on the previous slide uh, the, the specific diagnostic criteria, although there are some other uh, uh, um, there are some other parameters such as your LEH, your D-dimer, your bilirubin, your uh, transaminases, um, uh, which 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 would support um, uh, a diagnosis of HLH, even though it does not form part of that criteria. Now, lumbar puncture. Um, so, as you will see a bit later, the treatment one of the one of the complications one of the complications um, uh, of HLH is actually an abnormal CSF uh, uh, result. So, it, it's 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 characterized by increased protein levels in the spinal fluid. And one of one of one of the treatments one of the first line treatment for HLH, as recommended by the HLH 2004 protocol, is actually transthecal. Uh, cyclosporin and sorry, transecal methotrexate and uh, a glucocorticoid. And whether you continue with that uh, 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 um, intrathecal therapy is actually uh, dependent on your repeat lumbar puncture results. Um, and when you're making the diagnosis of HLH, you also need to rule out that it could. Uh, you, 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 well, one, you need to rule out for alternative sources of the, of the fever, and you also need to uh, try and find the trigger for, for the HLH. I think in, in, in this particular case, it was, the, it, was, it, was the, it was the chronic infection over the last two, three months because of this, uh, because of this infected uh, uh, bone flap. Uh, um, and guided genetic testing um, in, 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 selected, in selected cases. And this is a bone marrow uh, biopsy of, of, a, of a patient with hemo um, of HLH. As you can see, this whole this blue um, this blue thing in the middle is a massive is, is a massive um, uh, macrophage. So and, and you can see it's engulfed it's engulfed a couple of these uh, neutrophils on the left side, you know, with the multilobular uh, 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 granules, um, and so yeah, that is quite a typical finding that you will find on uh, bone on 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 the patient's bone marrow biopsy. Any questions so far? No. Okay. I'll carry on then. So the treatment as recommended by the HLH 2004 protocol is um, threefold essentially, fourfold I should say. So the mainstay of treatment is systemic cortical steroid. Uh, dexamethasone is your initial steroid of choice. Although in our, in our case, we actually switched to prenicillone. Uh, uh, later during uh, during the course of this initial therapy, and this is the uh, these are the doses that are recommended. So it's a it's a it's it it starts with a very high dose, and then it it, it gets gradually tapered off. Um, and the length of the of the um, of the therapy is normally eight weeks. Um, the top of the side is a chemotherapy drug. So this is recommended. Um, sorry, uh, come in. The door isn't locked. God. Sorry, I think I heard the code for the store. Sorry. Would you mind calling the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a little bit busy. Yeah, no worries. Sorry about that. Right. So etoposide is actually a chemotherapy drug. It's a, it's a DNA topoisomerase 2 inhibitor. And what it does is it leaves uh, broken strands in your DNA and then leading to apoptosis. Uh, it's actually recommended as uh, part of your initial therapy alongside your corticosteroids. 
uh, and this is the this is the treatment regimen as recommended. And as I said, uh, intrathecal methotrexate um, a, a, along with uh, corticosteroid, uh, uh, also given intrathecally, is is recommended uh, uh, between week three and six, uh, and may be continued if uh, uh, if the neurology uh, if there is a progressive neuro neurological uh, uh, deterioration or or, 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 can, can, um, uh, or or persistent neurological deficits, or the CSF is persistently abnormal, and you also start them on immunotherapy, um, immun immunosuppressant, um, uh, with your first line being cyclosporin. Once you once you uh, finish the first eight week of 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 uh, initial therapy. Um, you then have another look at the patient. Well, you will keep them under regular review, but at the eight at, at the end of those eight weeks is when you will decide whether you should you, you should still carry on with your steroids and and your and, and your and your etoposide and cyclosporin. And that will depend on whether the patient still has active disease. Um, and if so, then continue continuation therapy is 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 like this every two weeks, and you may need to consider them for uh, stem cell uh, allogeneic ASCT or allogeneic stem cell transplant. And often, if if you're if you're reaching this point, if you're reaching this point where you have to continue your therapy beyond the initial eight weeks in order to control their symptoms, then uh, 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 they should be considered for for a stem cell transplant, and this this continuation therapy is really mainly as a bridging um, bridging treatment before they get their stem cell transplant. And actually, um, saying 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 uh, that uh, the treatment is recommended as so in our case, we uh, we actually only started um, uh, our girl with. Uh, on prednisolone, um, on dexamethasone only, and then switch to prednisolone. We didn't actually uh, uh, start her on uh, cyclosporin or etoposide or intrathecal methotrexate. Um, um, I think she is getting she she is she is getting better. She's very responsive to the steroids, and she's not been having any fevers um, uh, since she was started on steroids. Um, on, on our last review, she had finished her an IV antibiotics, uh, uh, which she had been having for the last two months, and she is uh, switched to cormoxiclav uh, to complete for another two months. So we'll see we'll see how we'll see how she responds. Um, we were going to do a bone marrow um, aspirate, I think, but for some reason, in, the team decided against that because she was already responding to steroids. But I think it would have been very helpful if we could have some, um, uh, I suppose, objective evidence of, 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 of um, any bone marrow findings that will further support the diagnosis. But that being said, um, uh, her, her sky-high ferritin is quite a... It's quite a good marker for 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 the diagnosis of HLH, and that's it. All right, thank you so much, Chris. That's such an interesting case, and I think definitely a reminder for all of us who see surgical patients who end up a bit sick that it's not always the fault of the surgical wound <laughs> that's yeah. making them febrile and unwell. Um, yeah. You know, just because someone's had. A surgery or something that you know about doesn't mean that they can't be having something else entirely at the same time. Yeah. Um, fantastic case. Um, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, next up, Dr. Sue Height is going to give us some of our consultant-led teaching. So, so I'm just going to make you a presenter and then you should be able to share your screen. Okay, um, let me have a go. Perfect. Can you, can you see? Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Great. I can only see me. <laughs> Hopefully, you can see that. That was a really, really good presentation on HLH because it's actually it, it can be quite a confusing 
subject to talk about because it's quite complicated but I think that was really really well done and I, I suppose oh, if you. I had a comment I think she, that, that she's probably unusual in the sense she's a sort of older teenager and I think probably well certainly at Kings we tend to see them as babies as they're sort of coming in mm. either with liver failure which is often how they present to us or um, in the first few weeks of life because things like um, vaccines may be the primary trigger for the HLH in a baby mm, who's yeah, got the yeah. genetic uh, type and um, particularly yeah. in um, black Africans there's a what, one mutation in the perforin gene which is particularly common in that population so mm. we probably work with our local population probably see slightly more cases than would be seen in the general population so it's it's always a it's a difficult one because you you rarely see the full house of everything at the time they present yeah. it kind of can be a bit insidious or fluctuating I know we had one child I think we had to do three bone marrows over about six weeks before we got the diagnosis yeah. um, this is before we could do the flow cytometry for perforins we so strongly suspected it but we couldn't prove it and they kept kind of getting a bit better and coming in again with cytopenias and eventually we got there but it's 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 definitely one to watch because of the, the fact that they can run into serious um, multi organ mm -hmm. failure if they get really, really sick. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, I've been Thank asked you. to cover symptomology, which I will try and do. Um, so I've tried to pick out some thoughts. I suppose thinking particularly about HLH, when you're looking at a child who may have cytopenias, which might be isolated or, or more than one cell line, you know, how do you approach that? How do you decide? What to do and a little bit on calculation abnormalities so obviously i can't cover everything so uh, if you think about the child who's been as you say with pancytopenia um sometimes that cannot it may not be true pancytopenia at the beginning they may have a single line like they may appear to be itp isolated platelets that could be low and always always be vigilant for this because we've been caught out with children who appear to fit the bill something like ITP but actually if you follow them up over the next few weeks they other counts start to drop because of an underlying process so things like ITP are a diagnosis of exclusion you can only say it's that once you've ruled out other things so the, the symptoms you see in relation to the cytopenia are very much related to count so child won't usually get spontaneous bruising or bleeding until the count goes below about 20 unless they've had an injury of some sort or they you know played a contact sport and had a bang um, so you may not realise it's there because if, if your platelets are about 50, you can probably manage fine with most things. You could probably even have your appendix out with platelets of 50. But when you get down to less than 20, it's much more likely to be symptomatic. Similarly, anemia. We know that this can evolve very chronically and children adapt incredibly well. So that although the definition of severe anemia is less than 70, we see toddlers who may have haemoglobins of 30 who are still tottering around, um, obviously not for much longer if it continues to fall, but the, the rate of the development of the anemia is, is, is very important. If it's rapid, then clearly you're going to present much more quickly. And also with neutropenia, the, the risk of infection is very much related to the level of the neutropenia, and I'll come back to that in a bit. And the really important thing is what other findings are there? So do they have any lymphadenopathy? Do they have capacitor and megaly? Are there any signs of infection? And you need to look in the mouth. You need to look for mouth ulcers or, um, say, candida. Any any clues there? But particularly thinking about pancytopenia, look for dysmorphic features. So are they growing normally? Do they have any changes in their skin or nails? And um, I'll come back to that. So in terms of general groups of diagnoses that you think about, um, obviously HLH is up there, and that's usually a child who's unwell. You can have a child who's actually not particularly unwell, apart from their cytopenia, is in something, say, megaloblastic anemia, which we do see. So it's either B12 deficiency, um, or it can be folate deficiency if they've got a really bad diet, or they've got an underlying malabsorption in particular. So they may present actually not that unwell, but with low counts. Probably the, the other main group we see are children where they've got marrow infiltration with an acute leukemia at presentation. So they may actually not have a high white cell count. It may actually be um, everything has it, it is low and you've got to be very mindful of the fact that someone has to have a very good look at a blood film to look for the odd glance that might be present it's easy to, easy to diagnose leukemia when you've got high counts but low counts it, it can be um it can be missed there are very rare conditions involving the bone marrow which we do see in children but probably 
you know, less than one a year, to be honest, it's not common at all. Important to recognise that severe anorexia leads to, um, it's called gelatinous transformation in the bone marrow, where you just basically get necrosis of the of the um, stem cells and the um, hemopoietic cells, it, which is related to their severe malnutrition. It, once they start feeding, it does reverse, but you can actually see panpsychopenia in very severely affected um, children with anorexia. Other important causes for people who've been traveling, which obviously isn't anyone at the moment, is leishmaniasis, which can cause a big liver and spleen, um, usually with a febrile illness. And you need a, you've got to look for this to diagnose it. It can be diagnosed on the bone marrow aspirate and you see the parasites in there. So anyone who's traveled to um, parts of the world where there are sand, uh, sand flies, so places like um, the Mediterranean actually now, which it used not to be the case, or um, the Far East would be important to consider this. And then probably the other main group of the children who are developing aplastic anemia. So these can be um, congenital causes of aplastic anemia, and um, these, this usually involves problems with DNA repair, inherited problems of DNA repair, or the telomeres are abnormal. And um, this is an example of a child with Fanconi's anemia who has a particular sort of appearance. I've got sort of little pointed chin and slightly triangular shaped face. And you do once you've seen a few children with this, you, you can spot them in the street, actually, if you see them going by. And increasingly, there are adults with Fanconi's anemia who are, being, who are presenting um, with aplastic anemia. I'm sure you can spot the, the child who's affected in this family. Um, and the, one of the problems is they have increased uh, chromosomal fragility. So one of the, the tests, the diagnostic tests, involve um, incubating the, the um, lymph sites with uh, diepoxybutane, and they go into these very weird um, arrays where the, the um, chromosomes fragment and join up abnormally. And this is a reflection of the inherent DNA instability, and they're much more at risk for malignancy as well. And they will um, possibly there might be a background family history of early cancer. Um, and unexplained fetal loss, and also pulmonary and hepatic fibrosis because of the DNA repair problems. Typically, they have abnormal abnormalities of the thumb and a flat penar eminence, although maybe missing digits, but um, it can be quite subtle. Probably the more common causes are the acquired ones, um, and again, about 12% of children who develop acute severe hepatitis will go on to develop aplastic anemia, and it's thought that the, the insult to the liver also takes out the stem cells in the marrow, but they're not usually at the same time. The marrow takes a while to fail, so they can recover from their hepatitis and then two or three months later present with pancytopenia. So you always want to know if they had any history of any jaundice, any dark urine that might might have got better. Drugs can do it, um, prescribed ones, these are these are classically described, but also non-prescribed drugs, things like MDMA, ecstasy, you have to ask about that. You can, there can be um, <clears throat> can occur with severe vitamin deficiencies, but clearly this is very unusual to get an empty marrow. Um, it's usually a packed megaloblastic marrow. And the other main group are probably autoimmune um, in the sense that the, there's an autoimmune attack on the stem cells leading to bone marrow failure. Um, and then they have coexisting um, lupus or, or another undiagnosed problem. Chemicals um, and radiation. So polonium, Chernobyl, those kind of things will wipe out the bone marrow. Stem cells. So you want to take a sort of comprehensive history of um, environmental exposure. So to diagnose aplastic anemia, you have to have two out of three. And you can see that, you know, there may be things that might make you think about H and H. You're going to have cytopenias. But when you do a bone marrow, um, you find there's very reduced cellularity. The bone marrow is usually um, packed with cells. So it, it, it's said to be, it should, from, at birth, it's 100% occupied. And then it's 100 minus the age. So by the time you get to 90, you're only going to have 10% cellularity in the marrow as it all just kind of fades away. Um, but in a young child, you should have a very packed marrow. And this um, here, here shows you a sort of empty um, particle. And um, again, this usually, often it's an evolving picture. So the counts may be progressively falling at the time they present. And the severity is determined by the neutrophil count because this is largely what determines the infection risk, and it very it very much used to be that related to the mortality. The more severely neutropenic they were, the less likely they were to survive, mostly because of fungal infections. So the aim of treatment is primarily good supportive care. You've got to get them through this until they can get definitive treatment. So you need urgent treatment of infection, and they'll usually have a, a like the shared care 
patients, possibly patients, at rapid access for treatment of febrile episodes, and they're usually on anti. Hi everyone, I think Dr. Height has unfortunately gone offline, so I think we've lost her, I'll give you a second. Um, what we can do is we're going to have a quiz at the end, so how about let's get everyone set up to take the quiz and then if she comes back then we can always abandon it. Um, so let me just share my screen. Okay. So you should now be able to see my screen with a game pin on it to play Kahoot. Um, so if you go to www.kahoot.it and then enter in that pin, you can do it on your smartphone or on a laptop or a computer. So you don't necessarily need the app um, and pop yourself in a nickname. Um, you can choose whatever nickname you would like. Um, <laughs> I would suggest that you maybe use your favorite part of the hematology system. So maybe your favorite cell, um, your favorite plasma constituent. Um, and then once we've got a decent number of people in, we will start. And there's 18 of you here, so I'm expecting to see at least 15 people. It's completely anonymous, so no one will know if you get something wrong. Okay, macrophage, a classic. 
DD19, absolutely a hero. Uh, all right, we'll give it another two minutes. So let's see some more great cells. I can think of loads that have not been mentioned yet. Come on, let's have some more players. Good, Reed Sternberg, that's excellent. Okay, I'm gonna give it another 30 seconds. There's definitely more people in this meeting room. So come on, just, it's much more fun if you join in, I promise you. And I promise if Dr. Height comes back online, <laughs> we can revert to doing some teaching instead of this quiz. Uh, okay. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, all in vain. Fantastic pun. Okay, 10, 9, eight seven six five four three two one okay so how this game works is there will be a question that'll come up on the screen they're all related vaguely to cases like they would be in your mcq exams um, and the idea is that you get more points the faster you answer the question so it's about precision and it's also about speed so first question So which of the following is going to convert, confer a favourable prognosis in ALL? So for example, seven-year-old Polly has been diagnosed with ALL after presenting with fevers, lymphadenopathy and nosebleeds. Which of these things is going to have a better prognosis? You've got three seconds left to answer. Yeah, very good. Um, so it's having an age over one year. Girls tend to do better. Um, lymphadenopathy, I just made up. Um, and actually there's a low white cell count at presentation. Excellent. So who is in the front? It's hemoglobin, the classic. Um, so next question. What is going to be the most likely diagnosis for this case? So an eight month old baby with bilateral inguinal herniotomies, who's pale postoperatively with bilateral hematomas, Got a low HB, prolonged activated partial thromboplastin time, and normal thrombin and prothrombin. Which one might be behind this presentation? Very good, absolutely. So it's the haemophilia A that's going to be the most likely reason for this presentation. Uh, very, very good. Exam questions love asking about the different kinds of clotting tests, and so definitely one to revise. Who's in front? It's still HB, but there's some other people moving up the board. Um, so let's go on to question number three. Which organism is most frequently associated with this picture? So a six-year-old with vomiting, abdominal pain and bloody stools after a barbecue. She's got deranged renal function and reduced urine output with microscopic hematuria. Very appropriate for this bank holiday weekend's weather. Uh, which organism could it be causing this kind of issue? Excellent. This is your classic hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, and it's E. coli uh, 157 is the most common one. You are absolutely right that Shigella can give you bloody diarrhea, and Giardiasis can give you pretty nasty gastroenteritis as well, but it's E. coli that's most commonly associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome. Okay, excellent work from Reed Sternberg Cell, who's answered three questions correctly in a row. HB is still on top though, so there's two more questions to go, still everything to play for. So what's the likely cause of jaundice in this baby? He's A positive, DAT negative, mom's O negative, and he's exclusively breastfed. He starts some phototherapy, but the bilirubin still goes up and he ends up with an exchange transfusion. Which of these causes of jaundice might have caused this severity of jaundice? 
very good. So ABO incompatibility, although there is also some recess incompatibility there, um, that's absolutely right that it tends to be the ABO incompatibility that gives you this jaundice that continues to rise despite phage therapy. Right, I think Dr. Height is back on, which is fantastic. So we'll just do our last question and then we'll finish up Dr. Height's teaching um, just to see who's going to be the champion of this week's quiz. So final question, fingers at the ready. What is going to be the likely diagnosis for this case? A seven-year-old boy with poor growth. He's also got small thumbs and three cafe au lait spots. On his blood test, he's got low hemoglobin, low platelets, and a low white cell count. So these are all slightly rare syndromes. You probably don't see that often. But which one might be causing this problem for this boy? Yeah, absolutely. Franconi anemia sometimes comes with these skeletal abnormalities as well as a pancytopenia. So who is winner of this week's quiz? This month's quiz, even it's only once a month. Um, so in third place was HLH, very good. In second place was Reed Sternberg, a stellar performance. And in first place, it was HB. Very well done, very well done indeed. So I'm just gonna give control back to Dr. Height um, and then we will finish up our teaching for the day. So let me give you control back of the screen sharing. Okay, perfect. Everything just froze and um, I couldn't get it to work. Um, Fine. Okay, so just moving on quickly. <laughs> Anemia. Um, so uh, very, very common worldwide. As you can see, there's an age-related range, so, but essentially less than 70 is considered severe, which is when it's considered that it's not enough to maintain circulation. But we know that children do cope remarkably well um, at less than this. Um, hang on, let me put the bigger thing on. Oh no, it's disappeared again. Give it a second. Okay, so in um, yeah. pre preterm, yeah, preterm babes, obviously you, you have to take that into account. Um, babies get the, the majority of their iron loading from the mother in the last trimester, so if they're born prematurely, they miss out on that. And that's why particularly cord clamping can be helpful in delivering a bit more um, iron to babies if, if, if they can be allowed to have that if there's no emergency because their haemoglobin is going to fall from a relatively high level at birth in the first few weeks as you switch off EPO drive because you're in a relatively uh, oxygen rich environment and you're switching over from fetal to adult haemoglobin. Um, but the nadir should be at about three months and that should be the lowest in a healthy baby, but it should pick up after that. In terms of investigating anemia, if you tend to think of inherited causes, if you think of it very simply in terms of the three things that can go wrong, you can have a problem with the membrane, commonest being hereditary spherocytosis, which is actually the commonest cause of having someone in, a, in an RCPAP exam, a RCP exam where they're well, they've got anemia, mild anemia and a palpable spleen. That is almost, especially if they're not, if they're not um, from um, African or Caribbean origin, so a Caucasian patient on a good bet, it could be spherocytosis. Enzymes deficiencies commonest worldwide is G6PD, followed by pyruvate kinase and hexokinase, and the hemoglobin is again thinking of the commonest types, sickle cell disease and thalassemia major. In terms of acquired causes of anemia, <clears throat> obviously bleeding and nutritional are the worldwide the commonest, particularly iron deficiency. But you can also have breakdown of red cells that can occur in, in association with something like TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, where you get association with renal failure and abnormal liver function tests. Um, and you can see that in the, um, the sort of HUS type spectrum. Malaria is a very a, a common cause of, of anemia in, in traveling patients who don't take their prophylaxis. And again, bone marrow failure and infiltration or coexisting chronic disease. And as an initial investigation, one of the single most useful tests you can ask for is a reticulocyte count because this will tell you how well the marrow is responding to the anemia. So if it's um, a, a sort of bleeding problem, um, hemolysis, uh, you, you or sickle cell disease, you'll see an increase in reticular sites. Whereas if it's a bone marrow infiltration or failure, chronic disease or nutritional, it will tend to be low. And again, the report of blood film might tell you if there are changes suggested of spherocytosis or 
sickle cell disease. Another very useful test to get off at the beginning is an anti-globulin test or Coombs test, which will help you sort out if you've got an immune cause for your anemia. And again, if you're doing a group and screen, it's very easy to add that on as well. Hemoglobinopathy screen, you can't go wrong doing that, especially with our, our population. And again, if you can send these investigations before you give an urgent transfusion, if you have a very anemic child, it is very helpful because once you've given blood, you can't get a clear run at these, these results because it will be um, affected by the transfused blood. And the same goes for the G6PD activity. If you can think, it could, could this be G6PD, get the, get the assay off on the initial blood test. Once they've been transfused, you won't be able to do it for about three months, assuming they don't need longer purely transfusion. And again, this, this rate of onset, so if it's very chronic, it might be quite severe. You want to know about their exercise tolerance, breathlessness, but in babies, you, the only symptom or sign might be they struggle to feed, they get breathless when they're feeding. You need to know about the family history, again, ethnicity, anybody in the family who's had a transfusion requirement or had gallstones or splenectomy that might suggest an underlying hemolytic anemia, such as spherocytosis. Or um, you want to know about bleeding symptoms, and this might be um, menorrhagia in um, girls at puberty or other GI loss. And if there's any systemic symptoms, so fever, rash, joint swelling and those things. If there's a, a suspicion this could be G6PD deficiency, you want to know about the triggers, which I'm sure you all know include broad beans. That's a single dietary thing that they mustn't have. And it can be exposure to pollen. It doesn't have to be eating beans. It can be just under contact like that. Um, there's a list of drugs to avoid. Most of them are antimalarials, but there's also things like ciprofloxacin and septrin, nitrofurin toin, which may be prescribed by GPs. And then the other thing that can cause it uh, is mothballs. Children sometimes find these in grandparents' wardrobes and um, drawers, and they eat them thinking they're sweets, and that's enough to trigger an episode. Very important to get the dietary history. The iron deficiency is extremely common and exclusively breastfed babies. Um, they don't tend to get much iron um, in, in their breast milk. So if they're not being weaned, they will run out of iron supplies by six months of age at the latest if they started off fully complete. Okay, so this is an example. So you've got a two-year-old toddler who is very well nourished. They're growing fine on the center part, but they're very pale. Their hemoglobin is 45 with very lipidic indices, and they've got a high platelet count, which often goes with iron deficiency. Hypochromic microcytic uh, picture, and on their hematinics, they've got almost no iron stores at all. Sorry, helicopter. Um, low serum iron, low percentage of saturation, with normal B12 chromates. There's no hemoglobinopathy, and the treatment is, is get, getting their diet sorted out so that they're not getting all the calories from milk and adding in all the line. And you should start to see a response on the blood count with a rise in the reticulocytes, probably from about 48 hours onwards. Um, so by a week, you would like to see them going up by about a gram, a gram a week uh, until they, they respond. You have to treat for at least three months once you've got the hemoglobin up to normal to make sure their iron stores are built up. In terms of in, in severe anemia and sickle cell anemia, we always want to know what the steady state is in clinic when they're well, and that includes knowing the hemoglobin and the reticular sites. How big is their spleen? Um, because in, in about 10% of the children, they have a powerful spleen, but that's normal for them. And if they come in and they've got a fall of more than 20 grams per litre from their baseline, or the hemoglobin's less than 50, they're likely to need transfusion. But it's going to depend a bit on what their reticular sites are doing. So if they've got low reticular sites, you can bet they're going to need blood because they're not going to be able to cope. If, on the other hand, the reticular sites have increased, they may be able to mount a response and keep their hemoglobin at a reasonable level. Um, but it can be very difficult to assess on admission, and it, it, particularly in the middle of the night, looking under the horrible lights in ED. Um, so you, sometimes it's suggested you compare palmar crease pallor with, with parental skin palms to sort of get an idea, but it can be very hard. You want to know if there's any increased jaundice or hepatosplenomegaly, and they may have no pain. It's really important that the fact they're not in pain doesn't mean they don't need um, careful consideration. And particularly if there's parvovirus, which um, causes switching off of the marrow, you get an acute fall in reticular sites, which leads to a crash in the haemoglobin, and almost all of the children with SS will need a transfusion. SC less so because they start from a higher baseline haemoglobin. 
so they may not drop to the same extent. Always get the group and screen off at the time you're doing your initial tests because it just saves, um, saves time. The other reason that you can develop acute severe anemia is, is in someone who may have received a transfusion. This is a child who had a, a, an acute chest syndrome, had a blood transfusion and recovered, and they came back about a week later with severe back pain, and it was pretty generalised with fever, and they were tachycardic, and their haemoglobin was 34, and they'd previously been topped up to 100. So they got an urgent transfusion um, almost immediately, and the haemoglobin didn't increment at all. If anything, it went lower. This is what their urine looked like. It was described as Coca-Cola in appearance, and it gradually cleared with time. Um, and the other issue was they'd been treated with ketrioxone for their fever, and there's a known increased risk of fatal hemolysis in children with in, at patients with sickle cell anemia using ketrioxone. So we really try and avoid it if we possibly can. Um, in, with rather other things like ketrioxine, we use because of this um, known association. When they got to King's, they had a hemoglobin of 24 and then the ticks were not high enough. Um, so the possible things that could have happened here, they might have had G6 PD deficiency and had exposure to a triggering agent. But in this case, it was a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. They generated a new antibody and transfused all their transfused uh, red blood cells, causing this, this drop in hemoglobin. So um, it, just to be aware, you, it could have been ketrioxone did it, could have been G6 PD, could have been delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. Um, if it was an incompatible ABO reaction, it would have occurred immediately. It doesn't occur a week later. This would be for a new antibody that's been generated. Um, just another quick thing about interpreting liver function in sickle cell disease, because I think there can be some confusion about this. It's very common to have a slightly raised bilirubin in some children, and it's usually unconjugated. If it's conjugated, that's not okay. It's always unconjugated. There's also, um, they may co-inherit co Gilbert syndrome, which will give them a slightly higher baseline um, bilirubin. And also G6PD deficiency is common in this population, and it also can cause a slightly higher baseline bilirubin. So it's always worth testing for these things if you're not sure. So if it's a, certainly if it's above 100, I would be wondering if they have one of these or both these things as well. If you're looking at liver function, the AST and the LDH are derived from both red cells and the liver, so it doesn't tell you whether it's liver disease or red cell in origin, but the ALT is liver specific, so a normal ALT, um, it tells you they do, it's not a liver problem, it's, it's likely to be red cell hemolysis, especially if the LDH is increased. If you've got a raised alpha-fos or gamma GT, you've got to think about the biliary tree problems, obstructive or autoimmune disease, and just to be aware, just to reiterate, a raised bilirubin with a raised AST and LDH in a well child does not necessarily mean they've got liver disease. You need to check the ALT as well and the other liver function. Um, if it's changed from a steady state or there's conjugated type of bilirubinemia, then that is when you start thinking about liver disease and they can have a range of things, so-called sickle hepatopathy caused by sickling in the liver, viral hepatitis, things like EBV and CMV often, often cause acute derangement of LFTs and also autoimmune disease. Um, I'm not sure, I better just check with you about time because I'm not sure how long I've got or whether we've run out. I mean, we've got the platform got for kind of as long as we need. So um, feel free to carry so on. And I carry on yeah. If people can leave, then <laughs> I'll have to go in about five minutes because I've got to do a full round. So okay, um, no, that's, that's a, absolutely fine. Okay. Um, that's if I can get my slide to change, which it seems to have eased up again. Um, I think this is what happened before. It just didn't want... Oh, hang on. Neutropenia, very quickly. Okay. Um, very common. Again, mostly in children, it it's, can be quite severe. Uh, that's less than 0.5, but it can be transient and maybe only last a few weeks and not be associated with problems. Neutrophils are really important for maintaining mucosal integrity, particularly in the GI tract. And so in neutropenic patients who get into problems with neutropenic infections, it's often from their own flora or fungal infections, which can be airborne or translocate across mucosa sort of in the mouth. Um, and the risks associated with neutropenia are very much related to the severity and duration. So if you start with a stem cell, it takes three weeks to come out the other end with a mature neutrophil. And this is why children getting intensive chemotherapy can be neutropenic for so long. 
while you wait for this to happen. And using GCSF can accelerate this by maybe four or five days if it started at the beginning. You just can't hurry this process along any more than that. And in a child where their neutropenia is due to marrow problems, they will have a prolonged uh, episode. Whereas if it's due to peripheral consumption, they've got all this going on in the marrow, but the mature neutrophils are being mopped up, then they are much less likely to run into problems with severe infections. We do have a congenital neutropenia panel. We can do um, gene testing for some of the things like um, Kosman syndrome or um, cyclical neutropenia, which helps sort of confirm these diagnoses if we've got a child with unexplained chronic neutropenia. But it's far more common to see those that are related to particularly to viral infections where they go to the GP with an illness, the GP sends them for a blood test, it's ne they're neutropenic, and then they get referred in. And usually by the time they're seen, about three or four weeks later, the neutrophils have recovered. So it's always worth doing a follow-up test. And if it's recovered, it's fine. But if it's persisting, then you have to think about other things. There can be certain drugs which cause uh, suppression and often the um, anticonvulsants are, are, are culprits here, or things like meropenem. Um, and they can, in some cases, they suppress the marrow, but in rare cases, they cause agranulocytosis, which is much more serious, where it actually wipes out the maturing components. So you've got weeks and weeks of neutropenia to get through. Obviously, chemotherapy, as we see in our hospital patients, or radiotherapy. But there's also this autoimmune um, neutropenia of infancy, or alloimmune, which can occur in neonates due to maternal um, antibodies directed against paternal antigens, which are expressed on the baby's uh, neutrophils, so they're born with neutropenia, and it can take a couple of months to resolve, and it can be severe, and they can sometimes need treatment with GCSF or immunoglobulins if it's, if it's really problematic. The immune one tends to not really have too many problems. Very rarely patients do and need treatment for infections and admissions for intravenous antibiotics, and even GCSF in the most severe ones, but most of them are mild and they, and they resolve. Always think about nutritional causes, and um, underlying malignancy, especially the first time you see them, yeah, you need to check the blood film very carefully. We've been caught out with um, a child who has weeks later presented with blasts in the film that weren't there at the beginning. The mortality from neutropenic sepsis post chemotherapy used to be more than 90%, but now with good supportive care, which as a cost you, you provide, it, it cuts that right down. So although most children won't have um, invasive bacterial infections that are life threatening, we don't know that when they come through the door, and so we are probably over-treat, um, and that way we catch the one or two who are going to be um, overwhelmed by their sepsis. I've mentioned already the severity. Um, just to say ethnic neutropenia is, again, very common in our population. This is due to a polymorphism, um, and it really affects how the neutrophils behave. So the total neutrophil pool is the same as everyone else, but they're not isn't in the bloodstream. Um, so you don't get them on the blood count in the same way. They're marginated. That means they're sitting in the tissues or on the, um, uh, and they can be mobilized if there's an infection. So they're not at more risk of um, getting infections. We tend not to investigate neutrophil counts over one. If they're less than one, then we tend to do, do some tests, but it's surprisingly common and it, and it does not pose a risk to these children. However, if you've got a neutral count of less than 0.5, the risk of infections goes up. Um, and about less than 0.1 very much increase. And you want to do this range of investigations as a first line, hematomics, autoimmune stuff, immunoglobulins, probably worth doing virology. And there's this test that can be sent to the um, National Blood Service in Bristol looking for anti neutrophil antibodies, which will help to, to diagnose the immune ones. We will do a bone marrow if you consider it's, it's really not fitting any of the, the sort of benign causes. And there's this genetic panel we can do, which will help to pick up bone marrow failure as well as congenital causes of neutropenia. Um, and the individual risk factors will depend on the child and the other things going on. So if you've got a child with an indwelling line or breaks in mucosa, they're going to be much more at risk than someone who doesn't have those things. Um, I think I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to stop. I think I've got to go and do a, um, got to go and do a wall drown. So I'm really sorry. Okay, not no to Thank you so much. That was such a good overview of all the different abnormalities that I think a lot of us often see on blood films and then aren't quite sure what to do about them. Thank you so much for a brilliant session. Um,